what was the final nail in the coffin that made you jump ship? I think I probably pissed off enough people never to be able to go back. But how did that happen? So, funny story. Hello guys, my name is Alex Kirsten. I am probably best known for my work at Car Throttle for about 10 years. You're welcome, I'm not just a face. The only annoying thing was that everyone thought that I owned Car Throttle. I didn't have that many responsibilities. I just got to go on adventures. But then last year, for me, it was a kind of now or never moment. I started my own YouTube channel called Auto Alex. The channel just really blew up. What happened? I had a little bit of a meltdown and I remember just sitting on the sofa in my living room with my missus and just saying to her, I don't know if I can do this. So it was almost the speed of success that was your own downfall. Last year, I got an email from a, from a young lad. He's diagnosed with stage four terminal cancer. I'm not a crier, but after that phone call, I was in tears. I surprised Matt with his own car show. Mike Brewer was there, Richard Hammond was there, literally everyone. That was the best and biggest thing I've ever done. Alex, it is very rare that I get to sit down with someone that I've actually followed for so many years because my first memory of yourself was, I think it was 2016 Autosport International. Oh, bloody hell. And I remember it because out of everybody that I used to watch as a kid growing up, you were the first person I ever had my picture taken with really? at a car show. Have you got the picture? I have got the picture and I oh. think it will be included in the trailer okay. before this. Okay. And believe it or not, I was about 20 stone. Oh, so wow. It was slightly unrecognisable. So you've put on weight since then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gone downhill even more. <laughs> L literally, it's gone downhill even more from that, the sideburns. But um, yeah, that was the first time I ever actually met you. And it's safe to say that many years have passed and lots of subscribers, videos, life changes, all sorts since then. Yeah. But for anybody, I'm sure most people are here because they already know who you are and have come for that reason. But in your own words, who are you and what do you do? Uh, so yeah, my name's Alex Kirsten. I am probably best known for my work at Car Throttle for about 10 years. And then last year, I started my own YouTube channel called Auto Alex. So I'm Auto Alex on YouTube, Auto Alex on Instagram. I love cheap cars. Can I say shit cars? Yeah. Yeah, we can get a bit... Oh no, you are quite Shit sweary. boxes. Yeah. Shit boxes, yeah. I love I shit boxes. I wasn't last week with Adam C. I felt like I was interviewing the oh, queen. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah he, is, he is quite a queen. Um, but yeah, no, I love shit boxes. So um, relatable content is what I love doing. And it seems to resonate with quite a few people. And it, to understand what has got you into that position today, why you enjoy those things, why you enjoy filming those things and have turned that into a career, I think it's best to start by understanding somebody's earliest years because that's what moulds you. That's where you find what you enjoy, what you don't like. So what did your earliest years look like? Like taking it back to the days of school, what was your home life like? Did your mum and dad love cars? Where did it come from? Yeah, so um, I am um, half German, half English. Grew up as a kind of German kid in London with just my mum. I don't know my dad, don't have anything to do with him. But mum's always had, you know, an interest in cars. Her first car was a Carmen Gear when she was like 18, 19. That's what she was rolling around in, uh, in Germany back in uh, like Hamlin. And uh, yeah, she moved over in 79. I was born in 85. I'm really old, really bloody old. But um, I've always loved cars. And I, I find, I say this quite a lot, I find that you either like cars or football. It's very rare that one person likes cars and football. And I'm very much in the cars kind of camp. I used to love playing football, but not following. And um, I just remember as a kid just being obsessed with cars. I used to have remote control cars and little toy cars. And whenever I drive around with mum in her really old BMW E21 with like rust holes in the floors and everything, I would point out cars and I would say, oh, that's the back of a Granada or that's a Sierra or whatever, Vauxhall Nova, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, mum would always kind of correct me or she would just kind of develop my my knowledge of cars until I was about seven when I knew more about cars than mum. And um, yeah, just always been obsessed. So my life as a kid was, it wasn't playing video games like lots of my other kind of peers. It was being out in the garden, making tree houses. It was literally raiding um, skips in my local area, finding wood, taking it back to the house and making like two story tree houses in, in, in mum's garden and just um, anything that I could get my hands on to make, break, um, cut, destroy. Uh, that that was my kind of childhood. I had a really good childhood with uh, yeah with mum. She was uh, yeah definitely mum and dad. 
So for a very hands-on person, clearly, from that age and developing skills on how to build something, which is the complete polar opposite to me because I still can't really take a wheel off. But how did that develop? What was your, what was your first job? Uh, what was my first job? That is a good question. Uh, God, I've got to think back. <clears throat> I remember at uni. So my first proper job at uni was kind of in, in summer holidays was um, I cleaned a pub in the morning, a local pub in Chiswick on uh, like Saturday and Sunday. And then straight after cleaning the pub, um, I would go and work with a builder and I would do lots of kind of like repointing of the size of houses. And I remember being like 20, 21 years old, up a massive ladder, you know, three stories up with no ropes, no nothing, just pointing the size of houses. And it was quite sketchy, but really good fun. Uh, during my uni at Exeter, I had a job at Domino's Pizza. So I was delivering pizzas to people, not on mopeds, but in 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 my own personal car. Oh, because you assume straight away. I yeah, just picked, yeah, yeah, I pictured exactly. you straight away on, on a, a moped. moped. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but that, that wasn't actually the case. So we all got to roll around in our cars. We got a pound per delivery. Um, I had, at the time, what did I have at the time? I think I had an E36 328i Coupe. My mate had uh, a Mark II MR2 Turbo. We had a guy with a Mark I MX-5 Turbo, uh, a Glanzer. We had, like, out of all of the Dominoes in the country, we had the best cars. It was well known that we had the best cars. Um, and then I bought a uh, Peugeot 405 diesel that I ran on vegetable oil for about a year. Pure vegetable oil. And it was used as well. Was that, that from Domino's? It wasn't from Domino's, no, but it was from the fish and chip shop next door. And he'd phone me up and he'd be like, he was, uh, Geordie was like, Alex, mate, I've got some more diesel for you. And I used to just literally pick it up and then strain it through a bed sheet in my house, in my uni house. And then I had this hundred litre vat. And in the morning I would just open up the tap at the bottom and there would be my free diesel for the day. It was fantastic. Yeah. So you're quite inquisitive and trying to find ways to do things as well. But away from, say, uh, your work and trying to progress and earn some money, etc. You mentioned that you were at uni. So yes. what were you studying? And at that point, had you figured out what you wanted to do and where you wanted to go? No, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I went to uni because it was a done thing. And, you know, mum expected me to go to uni and Exeter was a good uni to get into, which I did. So what did I study? I studied German literature. I studied a bit of French, a bit of psychology. Uh, I spent a year abroad in Germany in Heidelberg which was funnily enough, the, the same uni that my mum went to when she was 19. And I had the best year of my life there. I had, yeah, I can't really go into it too much, but I had no girlfriend at the time, but I had many girlfriends, if you understand what I mean. Um, and it was great. Getting and on then, the beer. Getting on the beer, Which yeah. we must say thank you to the Hop Kettle Beering co Bre Brewing Company, because mm. we're currently outside their unit in Swindon, my local town. And once we finish this, we're actually going to go to Gert Wings. And yes. I had the founder, James, on the podcast before, and that developed into me being his business partner. So that's why we're here yep. with beers, about to enjoy chicken wings. Indeed, yeah, yeah. It, 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 this script writes itself. It's really good. Uh, so, yeah, um, what did I do? Yeah, so nothing really to do with cars at uni. However, that developed was when I finished at Exeter and I was still working at Domino's. And then the manager at Domino said, Alex, you should probably do something with your life. And when a manager at Domino's tells you that you're not doing anything with your life, you realize you should probably be doing something with your life and, you know, you know, make, make things happen. So I actually made a beeline for the local um, newspaper. I think it's called the Exeter Express and Echo or something because they had a motoring section. I did a bit of work there. And then the editor told me about this course in Coventry, which is a master's automotive journalism. So applied for that, got in that and got a job at Autocar. And then that is how my career as an automotive journalist started at Autocar in 2010, I want to say. Yeah. Which must have been pretty incredible for you thinking, well, hang on a second. I've just pa partnered this passion of cars with actually something that I can see going forward as a career. Yeah. So how did that, what, what was the first time you were ever on camera and was that for Autocar? No. So the first time I was ever on camera was uh, for my Coventry master's course where at the end we had to do the dissertation. At the end of the year, you had to do dissertation to hand in. It was either do 12,000 written words 
or do 6,000 written words and a video. Now, I'm inherently lazy, so no way in hell am I going to do 12,000 words because I don't have the patience. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So um, I thought, okay, I'm going to do a review on my own car, which was at the time an E30 325i coupe. And yeah, I, I did a review with my friend, with my best friend, Gareth. I got the camera from from university i got him to hold it i scripted everything i put in loads of copywritten music in there and everything i handed it in and i also uploaded it to youtube and do you know jalopnik yeah very well because actually tavarish exactly exactly right yeah but um when i uploaded that i remember jalopnik posting my little university video and the title was something like We don't know who this guy is, but his review is really cool or something like that. And the video got like 80,000 views. And I was like, holy shit, this is really, really cool. And it just kind of gave me a flavor of, you know, the first win, the first victory on YouTube. Obviously, I didn't earn any money from it, but it was just like, hmm, I wonder if there's something in it here. And that's actually, we must kind of make a point. That's before, because a lot of the guests I get on here, sometimes I compare to, um, Shmi or Paul Wallace or the, their kind of stuff, but they were all around like 08 and 09. So yeah. you can kind of say, oh, well, that was around the time everybody was in London spotting cars and it developed into that. But this was before then, right? Uh, that would have been, that, no, that probably would have been about 09. Okay, yeah, so it wasn't yeah, yeah. that kind yeah. of the car YouTube boom. Yeah, but I wasn't watching YouTube. I don't think I don't think I was really on YouTube at all. So I didn't know any of these names. I didn't know Wallace. I didn't know Shmi, nothing. It was literally, I think my inspiration at the time was a guy called John Quirk, who is a really cool automotive journalist and bike journalist as well. And he at the time was, I think, editor of Auto Trader. So this is really, this kind of predates Rory Reed being an Auto Trader. And he just had this like really cool swagger about him. And I remember interviewing him for the, um, for the dissertation that I wanted to do as well, that I handed in. And I was just like, this guy's so cool. So I, I kind of drew inspiration from him, actually. It's funny, like, thinking about this, chatting about this. I haven't thought about John Quirk no. for so long, but I was like, back in the day, he was like a really big inspiration for me. And you probably don't know the name. No, I don't. Yeah. but what Sorry, I... John. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> I do know the name Rory Reed, and I was actually going to come on to that later <laughs> in the episode. Yeah. But actually, that was a good place to to, to get to now, because... You became, from there, basically the face of the car throttle brand. Yeah. But how did that happen? So, funny story. So I was um, working at Autocar, maybe a year in or so, really bored, because it's a weekly, and I've never read Autocar, never cared for Autocar. Sorry, everyone. But everyone who works for Autocar loves Autocar, has grown up with Autocar. When I got the job, I remember I was upstairs in my mum's bathroom and Chaz Hallett, who was the editor at the time, said, we're really impressed with your video because that dissertation video, I actually burnt onto loads of CDs. I drove two auto car offices in Haymarket at the time and I literally just plonked them on all the most important people's desks. Do you think you'd have done that if it wasn't for your manager at Domino's giving you the kick up the ass to actually get out and have a bit of inspiration to go and do stuff? I think I probably would have got there after a while. It would have just taken me a bit longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think I would have coasted for a bit longer. But yeah, who knows? I might not be in your awesome podcast van had he not said that to me. Or have your own awesome podcast. (laughs) Yeah, I could have actually made it. I could have actually been someone. (laughs) (laughs) So you were putting CDs on the desks of all these places and it was those guys that picked you up. Yes. Yeah, it was. Yeah, that was that was the autocar people. And I, I think I sent an email and said, by the way, here's my video, because I also interviewed them for the video dissertation. It wasn't just the review. Um, and then they watched it and they were like, actually, maybe we'll give them a chance. So, I yeah, I got a phone call from the editor and he said, we'd like to offer you a job. And I was like, oh, shit, I don't want a job at Autocar because it's not really what I want to do. But. You know, at the same time, I was like, I have to take this opportunity because it is auto car. It's going to get my foot yeah, in the I door. I thought you'd be buzzing. I but... wasn't. I really wasn't. No, because I also got job offers at uh, Practical Performance Car, uh, Total BMW. And I think there was one other because during that Masters, we had a month to do uh, work experience. And everyone, like most of my peers, just did like a month at auto car. And I was like, nah. I don't want to do that. So I did one one week auto car, total BMW, um, performance BMW. And yeah, I got job offers at all of them. But the other ones were in Kent 
and this one was in London, so I was like, it's a no-brainer. You're very confident and excitable and happy and come across all those emotions in your videos. Was that original dissertation video like that? No, no, I'm a completely different person. I was like trying to be like serious journalist. Um, it's very, yeah, I mean, you can look it up. I think it's um, something like BMW E30 review. It's still on YouTube? It's, it's on YouTube, yeah, yeah. And I think my old, um, my old YouTube channel is something like Alex with like loads of X's, 85 or something. But yeah, you Watch can... that get more subs than this podcast after the, uh, off the back of this. <laughs> that would be funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to shut you down. You're Please getting cancelled. Please do both. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was very serious, but it was all like fully scripted and everything like that. I put loads of effort and loads of time into it. And for that, I think I got maximum marks for the video section, which was really cool. But um, you know what it's like. It takes a while for you to develop and be confident in front of the camera. Until you don't see a camera anymore. You just literally see someone holding a plastic box. And yep. then it's just it's just not a thing that you need to be nervous about. Same as public speaking as well. I used to be really shit at it and like shit scared. But now it's just like, it's just people. It doesn't matter. See, my problem is I go into things thinking I'm going to be really good in them half the time. Like my first ever podcast. Then coming back, putting it out and realising I really wasn't. <laughs> I actually needed the... Uh, yeah. Taking back a couple of pegs and yeah, realising yeah, you, you, you you, some... Um, you're never going to nail something on the first attempt. It's going to take a while. So how long did it take for you to start nailing car throttle? Um, so car throttle was an interesting one because I joined in, I think, September 2012. And we... Well, Adnan... Adnan is the was the founder. No, he is the founder. He was the founder. Both. Yeah, both. Because <laughs> he's no longer with Car Throttle. But um, he always wanted to do something a little bit different, you know, appeal to my generation and, you know, not be like the very serious stereotypical journalist. So he wanted to do things differently. So we tried to do the kind of the car reviews and do 60 second reviews of cars and stuff like that, but nothing was really hitting the mark. And then, um, and then I think I was out with Ethan the one time and we were reviewing a transit van that I blew two tires on as well. Cause I was just, I just hit a curb at like 40 or 50 miles an hour, blew both, both tires. Out. And then, um, and then as part of that, I was like, let's do a little skit about being a builder and like taking the piss out of builders a little bit. And I was like, Ethan, come, you know, come join me uh, on camera a little bit. And he had like a five second cameo, but people really liked it. And then I was like, maybe there's something in it here. And then we had a brainstorm. And we were like, why don't we do me as like the overbearing car guy versus Ethan, who's the friend who has to put up with the overbearing car guy. I remember the McLaren 570 to France video. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, would, have, would have been one of those. Yeah, no, so so that was that was actually, that was something different. But we had a we had a series called Two Guys, One Car. Right, okay, I remember that. Yeah, and that just blew up. And then we were like, okay, let's take it in this direction. And we also had car builds with my MX-5 called Phil. So the build series, that really took off. and And then the more we were on camera together, the more comfortable we got. And then Jack joined us and then we started doing the cheap car challenges and then we became the replacement for Top Gear. But how had you got to, to that point? Because we don't want to miss the bit between Auto Express and actually getting to car. Auto throttle. car. Auto car. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Edit that, Sean. <laughs> uh, so, okay. So from Auto Car, sorry, that was your original question. I've gone on a massive tangent. So I was tasked with going on a launch of, a, I think it was a say at me and we were going to Spain and we were flying out from Farnborough airport and Adnan happened to be there representing car throttle because they'd given him a chance to prove himself. And Adnan came up to me, spoke to me and, you know, he told me about this blog that no one had ever heard of called car throttle. And I was like, okay, that sounds quite interesting. We went our separate ways, thought nothing of it. And then I think a few weeks later, he phoned me up and said, uh, can we have a little meeting? And I remember I, I met up with him. We sat in a car for about two hours and he was basically saying, I want to take car throttle to the next level. I need someone to be website editor. So I was like, okay, I'll give it a go. So I handed in my notice at Autocar. Everyone told me I was crazy, including the editor. What are you doing? This isn't going to go anywhere. And joined Adnan and it was a hard, you know, first few years of trial and error, making loads and loads of mistakes. But sometimes when stuff would stick, it would really stick and then get us noticed. And then the more we did that, the more those people, those doubters 
came back to me and said, can I ask your advice on stuff? That was website editing, not necessarily videos. Yeah. So that was website editing. And then I kind of transitioned into the videos because Adnan at the time was doing videos and there was a conflict of he needs to do business stuff because he's a very good businessman while also doing videos. And I was like, let me give videos a go because I was always really keen, but I always had to be on website because there was no one else to do it. And then we employed someone to be a writer. And then I gave that guy, Matt Robinson, some more kind of responsibility to, to look after the website. And then I said to Adnan, now let me have a go. He was like, okay. And then, yeah, trial and error with, uh, with YouTube, the comedy skits, that stuff really, really hit home with people because you've got the car guy and the non-car guy and it works for everyone. It, you know, it resonates with most people. And then, yeah, the, the channel just really blew up. I think when what I started sort of subscribers, did it peak? At? I think when I started, we had like 10,000 subs. When I left, we were on just over 3.1 million. It was over 3 million. Yeah. Yeah. It was over 3 million. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's um, pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. That is a hell of an achievement. But how do you, do you think that it was also because a lot of say people in the YouTube space, a lot of people I speak to, they tend to maybe niche down to, you've got the supercar guys, you've yep. got the rebuild guys. Do you think it's because car throttle almost was holistic, encompassing a little bit of everything to do with all cars? They had ma managed to maximize reach or do you think it was due to the videos that you were putting out? And um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that car throttle did everything particularly well. I think the thing that we did extremely well was the relatable content. You know, it's like the old um, BTC saying, you know, you watch you watch the BTCC on a on a Saturday and you buy that car on a Monday, you know, like the Mondeo race cars, that kind of stuff. You you watch them race and then on a Monday you go in a dealership and you buy that car. For me, it was, we would go and do those trips in those shit cars that we would buy for 250 quid with our mates and then pop over to the, to Germany or whatever else. And then that would inspire people watching to say, if these idiots can do it, why can't we? And yeah, you might lose a couple of hundred quid because the car will break down and it might be annoying at the time. But if a car breaks down and it's annoying at the time, that is one of the best memories you'll ever have because it's funny as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm guessing at the start, so Car Throttle was already a business and yeah. you had the website and you're editing and you're doing blogs. And as you say, Adnan was a clever businessman yeah, very. behind it and bringing in cash. Yeah. There must have also been a point where you're like, because at 3 million subs, you're like, holy shit, we got some ad revenue here. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the ad revenue w was decent. Um, this was still, I mean, this was still a while ago, um, but it wasn't, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it was groundbreaking because Car Throttle at the time employed quite a few people. At one point, we had 20 people. Really? Because we also had um, two other brands, WTF1 and... We, we trialed stuff. That was you guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Car Throttle, yeah, bought out WTF1. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I loved WTF1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I yeah. did, up until Yeah, up, recent until, up until recent events. Uh, yeah, Matty and Tommy obviously leaving WTF1 and starting the P1 podcast, which is flying. Yes. Absolutely flying. Um. So yeah, it was it was a mixed bag of of everything from, I mean, we, we trialed for like a few months of football, um, website, um, we had a website called Misfits, which was, you know, female, female oriented. And then these were all kind of flash and pan things. Um, but the where, beast kept growing. Yeah. Yeah. The beast kept on growing. Yeah. I've completely forgotten where I was going with this. Yeah. <laughs> these beers are very good. <laughs> During that beast growing phase though, was there ever something that started ticking in your head going, <clears throat> damn it, I don't own this? Um, the only, I would say the only annoying thing was that everyone always thought that I owned car throttle. And if there was any ever, ever a problem, people would always come to me and say, oh, Alex, you sold out or Alex, you need to change X, Y, Z. And I was like, dude, I'm just an employee on quite a modest salary and I can't help you. But it was always directed at me. So that was quite frustrating. But um, I'm one of those people I never kind of like live above my means. I don't need that much money. So there was never anything, you know, in my desires. that I was like, I want to make money. I want to make this money. Because for me, I was just really content. My hobby was my job. I was with my friends and I loved life. And I didn't have that many responsibilities. I just got to have fun with my friends on camera, buy shit cars, go on adventures. But then last year... For me, it was a kind of now or never moment where I was like, I've got to shit or get off the pot. 
So I made the decision to to jump ship. So what made you, what was the final nail in the coffin that made you jump ship? Was it ultimately Adnan selling Car Throttle? Um, so yeah, Adnan sold Car Throttle, I think in 2019 to Dennis Publishing. So uh, Evo, Auto Express, uh, some bicycle. Not Auto Car. Not Auto, Auto Car, no, exactly. Um, and at the time we were promised the world, you know, um, you're going to get loads of budget. We're going to really help grow Car Throttle. And it was fantastic. Yeah, we, you know, we're all really excited. It's obviously a big corporation and, you know, purse strings do get pulled tighter and tighter and tighter and nothing changed. If anything, it got worse. And what really didn't help is that at the time we had a manager who was in charge of Car Throttle and we didn't know why because she had no clue about Car Throttle. It was really frustrating. I had to beg, borrow and steal for every pound I remember asking, begging pretty much for £150 for um, so I could buy a BMW E39 uh, 525D uh, that subsequently did like 2 million views. And I was like, I, I know this is going to do well. Don't argue with me, please. Just give me 150 quid. I think I actually paid for it myself and then expens- expensed it later. But there were so many frustrations and so many little things that were just getting in the way that I kind of felt you know, I don't think anything's ever going to change and I'm never going to be in charge of my own destiny. And at the time I was uh, unmarried. I'm married now. I've just forgotten my ring. My wife actually sent me a picture of, of my the ring on the table. So yeah, <laughs> sorry, Rianne. Uh, no kids. And I was just like, like I said, shit will get, get off the pot. And it was quite a nerve wracking time. My wife kind of said, you know, give it a go. I'll support you. I had enough money in the bank to, if it all went to shit, it would have been okay for about six months. And then I think what really did it was I spoke to uh, Mike Brewer, who's been a really good friend of mine for about five years. And he said, um, he said, Alex, I've told you for for like three years, start your own YouTube, YouTube channel. What's, what, what's holding you back? Which is easy for someone like Mike to say, because he's very established. He's got, you know, a few pennies in the bank. And then he said, um, if you want any money, I will back you. I will give you money. And then at that point I was like, if Mike is going to put his money where his mouth is, I think there's something in this. I didn't take any money from Mike, but the fact that he said that, I was like, if he believes in me, then maybe I should start believing in myself as well. So, um, yeah, May last year, May, 2022, well, April, sorry, I handed him my notice, um, had quite an emotional chat with Ethan about it. He knew it was coming, but still, you know, me saying I'm doing it. I'm going, uh, was, yeah, it was quite challenging. And did you try and get him? To I tried. I really tried. I really tried. Yeah. But he's got, he's married. He's got two kids now. He's very risk averse. Oh, which, you can tell that yeah. on camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is, which is totally fair enough. Cause he's got a family, but I, I really, really tried to, to get him to come with me. Uh, but he, he just didn't do it. If I was in this position, I probably would have been the same. Do you think you were quite, risk adverse to a certain extent compared with say uh, some of the other guys that would just I don't know just do it on a whim and hope for the best but it was that it was that extra social proof I guess from Mike Brew and belief that actually gave you the 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 tipping over the edge to go and do it yeah I think so I think so and um, like I mentioned earlier I'm I never really live above my means because I, I don't feel like I need nice things so for me I was just always like just really content with everything I had, like happy. I wouldn't say content, content's the wrong word. I was happy, very satisfied, but then something just, you know, switched in my brain and I was just like, maybe I do want more. Maybe I want to prove to myself that I can start a YouTube channel, give it a bloody good go and make a success of it. And speaking about making a success of it, because I spoke to one of your friends earlier. No, he's a colleague. He's not a friend. Okay. (laughs) If you're you're talking about Rory, he's my work wife. He's not a friend. Okay. (laughs) Well, he was very keen to give information. And something that he told me was that your initial goal with Auto Alex when you moved over was to get 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year. Oh, like maximum. Yeah. I I was thinking maybe 50K. What happened? We got 50K in about two hours. Yeah. So you genuinely didn't believe that would happen. No, 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 no. So, um, yeah, Rory and I filmed episode one and I think the title was something like, yep, I've left car throttle, which I got a really shitty, uh, phone call from car throttle about. Yeah. From the then boss. So sorry about that. 
Uh, but yeah, release that video. I think it's done like 1.4, 1.5 million views. And I was just like, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is my journey. This is why I've left. I hope you follow me. And people did. And within, yeah, within like a couple of hours, 50,000, within a week, 250,000, within like two weeks, it was like 300,000. And then it's obviously all plateaued. But it was just, it was mental. And I was getting messages from every single corner of the world. And I've never had such an influx of messages of kindness and positivity. And then at that time, I just, I had a little bit of a meltdown. And I remember just sitting on the sofa in my living room with my missus and just saying to her, I don't know if I can do this because this has been too much, too soon. And like the weight of responsibility not to fuck this up and not to disappoint people just felt like too much. And at that time, had I had the capabilities to click my fingers and just reset and go back, I think I would have done it. So it was almost the speed of success that was your own downfall. Own, own downfall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was because at that time I was still freelancing for Car Throttle. I got a gig at Auto Trader with Rory filming with him. So they were supposed to be my two income streams. Auto Alex was only ever going to be a side hustle to see maybe in a year, maybe in two years, I could make that full time. And then within two days, I had to completely like switch my thinking to, holy shit, there are now a quarter of a million people expecting videos. I'm not prepared for this because I don't have a team around me. I don't have any ideas. So what do I do? And then I was just like, maybe I'll just give it up quickly and then just sweep it under the rug. But obviously I stuck it out. What made what, you stick it out? Uh, what made me stick it out was prove. I wanted to prove to myself that I could give it a go. And I, I wanted to prove to everyone else that I had the balls, the nous, the tenacity to see it through and to create another successful YouTube channel in a space that is so full of already awesome YouTube channels. It's so difficult to break into YouTube as a newbie, but obviously I've got 10 years of doing YouTube. I just didn't expect many of those people to come with me on the journey. Because, yeah, you, you are right because there is a, uh, we hear it from a lot of guests, there's a growing, I don't, I don't know if problem's the right word because it forces better content, but there is so much content on YouTube. People have choice of what they want to choose, where in some industries they're desperate. They're waiting for the video to drop because there's like nothing there. Yeah. So you, your, your success of the new channel is obviously from what you built on a car throttle and what yeah. you took over. You mentioned that you got quite a nasty, well, not nasty, quite a difficult phone call uh, to deal with from that potentially happening. What was the fallout? Do you think you in a position that hypothetically you just decided to stop. Do you think there'd ever be a future going back in that direction? What, going back? Or are the relationships broken? Uh, I think I probably pissed off enough people for the, for never to be able to go back. Yeah, yeah, So it's, yeah, yeah. it's quite handy you've got over half a million subs now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and had I gone back, then I would have, you know, seen myself as a failure and many people would have done as well. So that that was never an option. But um, what I would say is that, um, and Rory, if you're watching and listening, switch off now. Uh Switch off, you bastard. Um, Rory has been with me from the start. You know, he's been saying to me for years, when are you going to start your YouTube channel, blah, blah, blah. And Rory is very, very business minded. He's very clever. Shut up, Rory. Um, and he's really good on the camera. He's what I like about Rory is that if I say something stupid or something that won't resonate with people, he'll just he'll just cut me off halfway through. Whereas usually you've got uh, a videographer will just keep on rolling and then you watch it back and you're like, why didn't you tell me I, I looked like a moron or said something really cut. stupid? Yeah. But with Rory, it's just like, no, no, that was shit. Let's do it again. <laughs> and and it's taken me a while to kind of understand that, but he's done it from day one and it used to piss me off when he used to do it. But, you know, I spent enough time with him to know that if he's cutting me off, it's because I'm doing shit and I can do better. So he's always been that constant on the channel with getting the best out of me, 
Um, his shots are fantastic. His edits are fantastic. His work ethic is like unrivaled. And yeah, we've just gone into it together. Just hundred percent. You had him from the start of Auto Alex. Yeah, yeah. From the from because the very start. I think yeah. that's really important. And so it's funny you said that. I resonated straight away because um, my um, editor, strategist, everything is a is a girl called Sean who's actually interviewed me before on this podcast, and she's exactly the same. If I if I do an episode and I say something or phrase a question a certain way, she goes, what are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, awful. Yeah. That's and what it you did need. Take yeah. me a couple of episodes yeah. to be like. Piss off, bitch. Yeah, <laughs> what yeah, are you saying about yeah, my interview and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that ultimately only drives you forward and forward is the direction that you're clearly going in. So yeah. what what has this year been like for, for growth, events, management and, and where you're going with this? Yeah, so, so I would go back slightly further. So growth wise, it's been fantastic. Uh, you'll obviously know Taylor from the YouTube channel. Uh, so Rory and I went to film with Taylor. We were going to do something completely separate. We were going to fix up my E53 X5 BMW with him because he's, you know, former AA's 10 year mechanic and he loves his BMWs. And we arrived at his unit and we saw all of these incredible cars, BMWs, you know, Mercedes, Porsches. And, um, in the corner there was this, um, BMW 635 CSI and he was like, oh yeah, you know, I paid 25 pounds for that. And we were like, what? And he bought that car because it was abandoned in a council garage. He he spoke to the council. He applied for a logbook. He got the logbook. And eight years later, that's his car. So he effectively paid £25 for that car. He spent like 10 grand on it since. But that video has done like 1.5, 1.6 million views. And he's just so entertaining and bubbly and funny it's actually a brilliant and, way of keeping your overheads down yeah, doing this exactly, shit. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like you've got to fund the monthly he's on a McLaren. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, yeah, so he's he's kind of been in in most videos uh, on the Auto Alex channel and people absolutely love him. So the growth is definitely down to him as well. So I really enjoy being able to take Rory, take um, Taylor, whoever else, Luke, who drives for us as well, to the Nürburgring pay for food, pay for hotels, pay for experiences and stuff like that. So good out there. It, it, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I love it. Um, but yeah, the, the growth has been phenomenal. We're up to, I think, 568,000 subscribers at the moment. Views are fantastic. We're doing like four, 500,000 views. Uh, we've got a podcast now, which is doing quite well. Uh, there's a V2, Autolix V2 channel as well, where we put like podcast cuts and other bits. There's merchandise now, Autolix merchandise that I set up with my best friend, one of my best friends, Chris. Um, and yeah, we did we did a show uh, a couple of months ago, Bank Holiday Monday it was, called Shedfest. And it was a sellout show at the British Motor Museum. 5,000 people were there. It was amazing. We had Tavarish flew in especially to be there. Mark McCann was there. Mike Brewer came. It was his birthday. And we just had a really, really wicked day. So this year, stuff has really, really exploded. I'm super excited about where it's gone. But at the same time, um, last week especially, I was at a point where I was like, I'm very nearly at breaking point. Like there is too much going on. I'm doing too many things. I'm not spending enough time at home. I'm driving too much. I'm at too many events. I need to rein it in and just sleep because I, I wasn't sleeping enough. I was going to say, up to you saying that, hearing, yeah, you know, I was getting like excited, like hearing you reel off. So I love that kind of way of thinking. We've launched the merchandise. Yeah, We've launched yeah. the V2 it all channel. Sounds so good. We've launched the podcast. We did. I was going to say, is that creativity all from yourself, just having total free reign and budget now? The channel's yeah, taken. Yeah, off. I mean, partly. But um, yeah, my friend Chris, with whom I do the merch, he, you know, he approached me and said, I would like to do merch with you. Is this one of the pieces that you're wearing? No, this is actually Petrol Heart, which is a Portuguese uh, merch company. And they are fantastic. So if you like really cool kind of car art on T-shirts and hoodies and stuff, check out Petrol Heart. But yeah, no, this isn't one of mine. I just, I literally have two drawers full of Petrol Heart T-shirts. It's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, Chris said that he wanted to lead it. So yeah, I've put money into it. A bit like you invested in it, put my name against it, promo it. And the merch is, it's doing okay. Uh, we haven't actually promoted it at all anywhere, but you know we're already getting sales online. Uh, the 
the car shows, we've only done the one car show, which was Shedfest. Well, that was an Auto Alex car show because I also organized, well, Roy and I also organized Matt Wood uh, last year at Goodwood. Do you know about that? Okay. The stage so, is yours. Okay. Right. So um, Matt Wood for me is probably one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. So back in early days of car throttle, I, sorry, car throttle, auto Alex, bloody hell, it just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> Freudian slip. It's still not quite gone yet, is it? <laughs> no, it really isn't. No. This morning when I was do, doing my own podcast, I was like, hello, welcome back to the car throttle. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it was um, June or July last year, I got um, got an email from a, from a young lad called Matt Pollard who told me his story. So he's diagnosed with stage four terminal cancer, brain cancer. <laughs> He's got a Mark 1 MX-5 with his dad and his mum was also diagnosed with cancer shortly after he was diagnosed with cancer. So really, really tricky times. And he emailed me to say, uh, Alex, I've loved everything you've done. I know you've got an MX-5. Um, can you help me um, fix up my MX-5 that I own with my dad? so I can surprise my dad with it to say thank you to my dad for being the rock of the family, because obviously he's got terminal cancer. This, his, his dad's wife, his mum has got cancer as well. And then there's a sister as well who doesn't have cancer, but obviously she's struggling yeah. with her brother and mother having cancer. And, um, I looked at the email, I was like, holy shit, like everything I'm doing at the moment, Just video wise, seems... isn't, is completely unimportant. And I, um, I phoned him up and, uh, and I spoke to him and he said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going through chemo. It's stage four. It's the worst you can get, but I, I just want to give back to my dad to say thank you. And then, yeah, I chatted to him for a long time and yeah, both of us cried. I'm not a crier, but after that phone call, I was like, I was in tears. And then I phoned Rory straight away and I was like, Rory, whatever we're doing at the moment, I can't remember what it was we're cancelling it and we are going to do everything to make his life, his dad's life, his family's life, like completely change it. So we took the car. I spoke to all of the companies that I know. Um, uh, we had uh, detailers, we had wheels, tires, brakes, uh, everything. We spent about 10 grand fixing up that car that Matt could give to his dad because Matt wanted to fix the car up, give it to his dad and for them to go to car shows together to enjoy, you know, the final car shows. And then I thought, no, that's not enough. So I then spoke to Goodwood, Goodwood circuit. And I was like, this is Matt. This is his story. I want you to give me a day at Goodwood. Give me a day. And they were like, okay, you can have a day at Goodwood. So they gave that free of charge. I then invited, I don't know how many, I think we had like 3,000 people or so. And uh, I surprised Matt with his own car show with his car that had been completely fixed up at Goodwood and drove him into his own car show. Everyone cried again. Mike Brewer was there. Richard Hammond was there. Uh, Matt Armstrong, literally everyone. I invited everyone. And I set that up with Rory in 12 days. And that was the best and biggest thing I've ever done in my life and pro probably ever will do. And Matt is still with us. And his dad, I speak to his dad quite a lot and he says, yeah, we think that, you know, you doing all of that, setting that up has helped prolong his life. You didn't have that in your, uh, no, I didn't, your iPad, I did, did I didn't, you? I didn't have that in my <laughs> iPad at all. Yeah. That is. But on that, on that first Matt Wood that we've done at Goodwood, we raised 50,000 pounds. And, and all of that money went to Matt. And I said, here's 50 grand. If you want to go on a private jet to the Bahamas, do it. Do whatever you want with that money. And uh, yeah, he has been living his best life. And then we did another Matt Wood, which was earlier this year. We raised another 15 grand. Um, and I think a lot of that, well, 15 grand, I think went to the Fountain Foundation that looks after cancer sufferers that looked after him. And we've been doing yeah quite a lot of fundraising for the Fountain Foundation as well. My um my dad who's sadly not with us anymore, he one of his final things he ever did in his company, which is when I I started to learn about how 
the problem with teenage cancer in the UK and actually how prevalent it is at the minute is we did a charity rally mm. in 500 quid bangers across Europe. Yeah. Um, and everyone thought he was crazy because we're a building company, paving companies, but he invited all of his customers to buy a 500 quid car and drive it around Europe. And I went as well and loads of people from work went. It was absolutely incredible. And he'd, he'd actually done it. He chose to support Teenage Cancer Trust and the Rainy Day Trust. He'd done it because my mum had had breast cancer for eight years, which luckily she is over now. Mm. Um, but it was one of the final things he did. And it, 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 it it's mad because it, it's not even so much the experience of going on the rally. It's what you do take away from it. And yeah. like your story then, I heard stories on, on the rally that were that were similar to that. And it, it never leaves you. And it does make you appreciate in those moments just how valuable life is and, and kind yeah. of can help you put into when you get overwhelmed, when you get too many subscribers in a short period oh, of time. Oh, me. Yeah, what a problem. Yeah. It does bring you back down down to earth. Yeah, completely. And um, I, I think that, the amount of good that can be done through cars sometimes gets forgotten when on BBC and news, all you've got is they're going to put in noise cameras to catch people. They're going yeah. to catch people this, but I think as a community, we've just got to, we've just got to keep going. But um, yeah, have a look at the video. I would urge anyone listening to just type into um, to YouTube, uh, Matt Wood, or I think the title was I set up the best car show in 12 days or something like that. Now that's obviously something that you've done. That's really wholesome. Yeah. What have I done that's shit? <laughs> no, no. I actually, uh, because your on screen persona, as we kind of touched on earlier, is bubbly and happy and hi, guys. Yeah. Are you like that in real life? And away from that softer side of you that you just spoke about there as well, how competitive are you on a scale from one to 10? Oh, yeah. Crazy, crazy competitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it's, it, it's quite annoying how competitive I am. I'm competitive with myself. I'll dare myself to do something, even if it's dangerous. So you mentioned that you're not in in this, so you don't get your enjoyment from this. And I think that's really clear in your story, actually, for financial gain. It's more of this is you want to be creative. You want to be able to make videos. You want to enjoy your day to day life. And you can clearly see when that stopped happening at Car Throttle. Yeah, that was obviously the problem that ultimately made you leave and do your own thing. And now you're back to doing that. Now, in F1, WTF1, guys. Most of the drivers, over 60% of the drivers, you can see, clearly believe that they are capable of becoming world champion. Yeah. So you just mentioned you're also ultra competitive. Do you look at that YouTube space and think, I am going to have or going to be the biggest automotive platform in the UK? No, I, d I don't want the most amount of subscribers. Uh, I don't want the most amount of views. I just want to do the best jobs be the most entertaining in my space which isn't supercars it's not rebuilding cars it's who is the next top gear and i would hope that people say it's it's the auto alex guys i want the views to be good but it's one of those things it's like once you get to 400,000 views what's next 500,000 are you going to be satisfied with 500,000 views for a long time no you always i'm always chasing the next thing and it's not to say that I need to get a million or 2 million subscribers. But when I get a video that does like 500,000, part of me thinks, why didn't it get 700,000? I'm never particularly satisfied. Do you need to break what you did at Carthroll? What's that? Personally, do you need to achieve more than the numbers? Uh, at no, 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 I don't. I don't because it's, this is my own thing and it's, it's completely different now. As long as the views are competitive, which they are, um, I'm totally happy. But I'm never that satisfied. You know, it's just like, why isn't it done slightly better? So where is the competitive there? What do you compete with in your own life? What, what are you looking at? Is it because you said you're not chasing the views, but then you do want the extra views. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean. You're competitive over content ideas? Not, not particularly. I would say it's more like a sport or or go-karting is stuff like that i always want to be the fastest the quickest the strongest which i haven't been for a long time because uh, i'm 38 now and i've just yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly no but um it, I, like going back to it i i compete against myself a lot like i'll give myself a bit of a goal 
And then if I don't exceed that, then I'll be pissed off. Or if you exceed it, you'll be pissed off. Yeah. I'll just, yeah. I'll just, I'll, if you exceed it by 200,000, <laughs> yeah. you'll also yeah, be pissed exactly. off. There's a very fucking yeah, fine window yeah, yeah, you're operating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I'm, I'm very competitive in certain things. I would say with YouTube, I'm biding my time. I've learned to bide my time. Like I said, I'm a bit older now. So, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not chasing too many things at the moment, but if you get me in a go kart, I will. I will fucking destroy have you. Have you seen the new place in Manchester? Chaos carts. Let's go. G- genuinely, have you seen it? No, I haven't. So that what they've done, and this is brilliant because you said you love coming up with new creative ideas and everything. They've basically mixed AI and go karting. Oh god! To create what is essentially, but they couldn't call it Mario Kart. Oh, okay, so I've seen yeah. it. It's called Chaos Karting. Yeah. And there's like projectors everywhere. So you pick what track you want to go on. Oh They'll project God. it down onto the floor of the unit. But every go-kart has got laser beams yeah. on it and buttons. So if you're going along and I get you in front of me and you're going around the corner and I get you in a line, I can click a button and send a banana spinning across the floor and it will lock two of your wheels and spin the cart and stuff like that. I don't want to do that. So- <laughs> I just want to do normal it looks racing. incredible. <laughs> Well, to be fair, we might actually have a shot at that because just before this uh, podcast episode started, I was actually informed I've been invited on next year's soapbox race. Oh, bloody hell, yeah. So, <laughs> my God. so we might actually get a chance to see your competitive side. But before we, I think so. before we finish up, the last thing I'd like to ask, because I think it's quite prevalent, is you were clearly told when you were at that magazine years ago when you were younger, that's a silly idea. Don't yep. make that step. Don't go and do that thing. And you, as I say, someone that's kind of found your own way and tried your own things and made them stick. What advice do you have to all of the young people? The guy, even I suppose even me, I have a reflection. It's amazing to be sat opposite you doing a podcast when you were the first person I ever met when I was walking around a car show getting 10 views, doing something silly all those years ago. So what's your advice to those guys? Um, I would say don't get too hung up on what other people are doing. Uh, if you have an interest in something, a specific interest in something, and you love it, then you will excel at that. If it's not like the hot topic at the moment, don't worry, just keep on going because trends come and go. You know, the whole supercar rebuilding thing wasn't a thing like three years ago. No one gave a shit. And now it's like the hottest thing that anyone can do. But if you have an interest in something completely separate to that, then just build up slowly, bide your time. Don't try and rush into YouTube and expect that you're going to get 100 200,000 views in the first month because that's not right. You will make loads of errors, you will probably be embarrassed with the vi- first videos that you do. Doesn't matter, that's part of growing. So, take your time with it. Be true to yourself. Don't be a sheep. Don't follow other people and do you and it will come good. I think um somebody sat in the corner of this of this van just before I finish up might actually be quite happy with that statement because he's just started a youtube channel called bulb bricks where he's re rebuilding lego cars yeah. inside the cars that he's actually building and a few of our mates laughed when he first did it but i thought that is such a unique concept yeah. that's not been done before and it's absolutely flying so if you love lego and love cars i must shout out our assistant in the podcast van steve who is smashing bulb bricks at the minute and we'll put his stuff there check out bulb bricks but other than that i want to say a massive thank you to alex for coming on the podcast especially with the growth of your own podcast etc it's been amazing for you to take up the time out your day to come down it's all good. we're about to go and smash some chicken at girt wings finish off our pints maybe have another one mate it's been a Cheers, pleasure yeah, thank you very absolutely. much Cheers. Thank you very much.